Today I want to talk about undergoing a transformation or being changed from the inside out. Isaiah 64, 8 says, but now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay and thou our potter. And we all are the work of thy hand. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. We sing that song, change our heart, O God. And that's what we want to be on the potter's wheel as long as we're here. Even though he has to smash us down sometimes and build us right back up, we're on his will. He knows what's good for us. He knows when to, to, to form us and smash us down and form us until we are the image and we are like Christ. Romans 9, 21 says, hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. So last week we talked about the submission of ourselves to Jesus Christ. And this is kind of along those same lines of submitting ourselves to the Lord because the only way that we can have that transformation is when the Lord works in us and we cooperate with his workings. That's how it works. He doesn't make us. It is a transformation that is voluntary. And this transformation can change our relationships, our words, our thoughts, our actions. That's what we need. Some of us came into Christianity late in life and we were already doing what we were doing. That's why it's good to come in as a child so the Lord can form you as you grow up. But we're all his children. And even though we came in late in life, God wants to transform us. He wants to change us to reflect Jesus Christ in our lives. Praise the Lord. Then we are on a journey to bring others in. So it's not just to us to be transformed and changed so we can live and reflect the glory of God it is for us also to be able to bring somebody else in. Somebody that needs Jesus Christ in their lives, somebody that needs a touch from the Lord. The Lord works with everybody on the individual level. Somebody get some people get it quicker than others. Some people's lives are transformed quicker than others. That's all the Holy Spirit's business and his job. That's what he's in charge of. We just need to submit to the Holy Spirit of God and he will give us the fruits in our lives from the inside out. For example, I've talked about love in some of my previous sermons, learning how to love like Jesus is something that God wants. That's part of the the uh, change in our heart. That's part of the what the Bible calls the circumcision in the of our heart. God has to cut off something. He has to work in us on an individual basis. He knows what we need on an individual basis. What I might need is maybe what you already have and vice versa so that is part of learning the ministry and learning to minister to people because jesus the holy and the holy spirit the god knows 
what each and every person needs. And part of what people need is the word. Without that word, it's just like knowledge that of uh, my head knowledge of what I'm thinking that I need. But as we walk with the Lord, he starts to maybe stir up something inside of us that we might need to let him take out of us. Praise the Lord. So it is a work of the Holy Spirit. He delivers us from ourselves. What we were before the Lord. It is a trans. Formation from the inside out and it starts with salvation without salvation God doesn't have the, your permission to work in your life yes he works on the wings of prayers like I said I don't know how it all works in the spirit realm but God works on our prayers on unbelievers ones that are getting ready to come into the Lord. And the quicker we learn that it is a warfare, a spiritual warfare, and that it's not smooth sailing, and it's not going to be smooth sailing for them, because sometimes when you pray, the battle gets even hotter. So God has to train us. God has to take us on the battlefield. He has to show us how to navigate in the spirit realms and how to do it in accordance with the word of God and according with his spirit and not according to our own soul and our own mind is by the spirit of the living God. So salvation, then the Lord wants to sanctify us, set us apart, and make us holy. So it's a process that we go through. God doesn't want us to stay the same throughout our Christian walk. He wants us to grow in him. And it's up to each and every one of us. It's our responsibility to get with the Lord and develop that relationship with him. First Peter 1.22 says... Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned. That word unfeigned means genuine, honest and heartfelt love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. And we can't love one another if we don't love God, the Bible tells us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself. He says on these two hang all the law and the prophets. So it's developing the love of God within us through the word, through prayer, through doing the things of God. And we will be able to love one another with a pure heart fervently. This love comes during a part of the holy change that God works in the heart of the believer. Our hearts have to be circumcised. Our hearts, we don't even know our, the Bible says the heart is deceitful. Who can know it? God has to do some surgeries inside of us as we submit ourselves. Jewish circumcision was an outward sign of being set apart of, by God. But our circumcision is a spiritual thing that God does. And it begins when we are truly born again and through our cooperation with the spirit of God it's in the mix It's not all God It's not all us It's us in cooperation with God 
working with God. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. That is what we're after, loving the Lord thy God with all heart, soul, mind, and strength. There may be some idols or some things in our lives that God may have to get rid of. There may be things that are hindering the operation of God working through us. So we just have to get with the Lord because he wants us to make it. He wants to cut away the selfish ways of our hearts. We know that people are generally selfish and self-seeking. We grew up that way. That's how we were before we met Jesus. Some maybe more selfish than others before the Lord. But God will change that if we allow him. He can take those selfish ways of seeing it the way that we want to see it and it's only our way and he can change it and transform it to where we are operating in his will in our lives through the will of God. If we allow him, he wants to open up our spiritual eyes, ears and mind to his word and his spirit. Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That is a pretty direct scripture. That scripture says without holiness. No man. No person shall see the Lord. Holiness is not artificial. Or outward. But a practical holiness available to every believer that has the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit living inside of them. It is an inward holiness, holiness unto the Lord, along with human kindness. I want to go to the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And I want to say this sermon isn't solely about doing good works for other people. There are many in the world today that do great acts of human kindness or humane acts to help other people. But they still don't have Jesus in their lives. Just because we do great acts of kindness does not necessarily mean we are living a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. It's honorable and God is looking at our heart. In Luke chapter 10 verses 25 through 37. And it says. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26. And he, Jesus, said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? So this lawyer was an expert in the teachings of the law of Moses. He already knew what the law said, but he was trying to lure and trap Jesus. But Jesus spoke to those that were listening in this chapter here is also the chapter where the 70 had returned saying, Lord, Lord, even the devils are subject to us in thy name. But Jesus knew the heart of men and he knew the heart of this lawyer. So Jesus said, what is written in the law? 
how readest thou? So Jesus was not teaching salvation by keeping the law. We can't earn salvation. The Bible says that the law was the knowledge of sin in Romans 3.20. The law showed mankind what a guilty sinner he is. We know that salvation is for sinners who acknowledge their lost condition and we're saved by grace, not by the law. This lawyer did not recognize his lost condition. And back to verse 27. And he, the lawyer, answered, said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. In verse 28, and he, Jesus said unto him, thou hast answered right, do this and thou shalt live. So if the lawyer had been genuine, he would have said right then, I'm lost, helpless, need love, mercy to save me. Lord, save me. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So back in uh, Luke 10, 29, But he, the lawyer, willing to justify himself, he was still stuck on trying to trip up Jesus said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? The lawyer's heart wasn't right, and Jesus knew it. He knew the heart of that lawyer. He was trying to justify himself and, by, and said, who is my neighbor? So who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? Matthew 5, 43 through 46. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Those are your neighbors. The ones that despise and hate you and persecute you. But look what Jesus said. He said, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That is one of the opposite things that we learned when we were coming up. We learn to get our neighbors back. They did something to me. Hey, I'm going to get you back even more. So when we come to Jesus, that is part of our submission and surrendering to the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of the ministry of Jesus Christ in our lives to get that out of us so we can receive the love of God in us. That's part of the transformation. Verse 45, that ye may be the children of your father, which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and send the rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which, which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. So the Bible says that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. So if he had picked and choose, where would we be right now? We'd be lost. It's easy to love those that love us. It's easy to love those that are like us. How hard is it for you 
are those listening to this? How hard is it for you to love somebody that you know that hates you? How hard is it for you to feel in your heart the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ rising up into you and to be able to see that person spiritually rather than by your soul or your mind? It's a work of the Holy Ghost. It's not something that can be pretended. Yes, that old song said, they smile in your face, but they want to take your place as the backstabbers. You know, a smile is a smile. But as Christians and people that know the Lord, we're supposed to be genuine when we do things. How many ever smiled to somebody and you knew in your heart it wasn't genuine? <laughs> you were just giving them a, a smile back like they gave you. You knew they hated you and you probably hated them. <laughs> if we were to be honest about it. But those are things that the Lord wants to change. The Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. God wants to get rid of the impurities in our heart, the impurities inside of us so that we can reflect his glory. So we can pray for our enemies that we meet daily sometimes. And pray in a godly manner towards our enemies because we may have enemies but we have to remember we are not wrestling against flesh and blood you see as a as a christian that's a spiritual christian is not just for sometimes we're spiritual and sometimes we just let it all hang out because we want to, we just got to get it out. We're upset. We got to get it out. The Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Our real enemy is the kingdom of Satan. That's our enemy. And sometimes that very person that you are an enemy with is the very person that Jesus wants you to lead to him. Believe me, I've experienced that firsthand many times over my Christian life. Because the devil will do anything to not let that person find out who Jesus is. But that is a part of our growth. That is a part of our transformation to let the old man be shaved off of us and take on that new garment that Jesus Christ puts on us and reflect the glory of God without even trying because it's a part of us. Our neighbor is anyone made out of flesh and blood like us. That's who our neighbor is. You driving down the street, you see that same person that hates you stranded on the side of the road. That same person that you've had battles with. In this midnight at night, nobody else around, you see that person stranded on the side of the road. Will you stop and help them? Or will you just keep on rolling? Back to Luke 10, 30. And Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment 
and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. This world has been a den of thieves since the fall of Adam. People are taught when we were coming up, we were taught to mind our own business. Or to get what we can get out of others. If you grew up in that fashion, some grew up as get what you can burn bridges, no matter what it takes, get what you can to get where you got to go. Those are ways that we picked up along the way before we met Jesus. Only those taught by the Bible can look not at their own, but at the good of others. Verse 30 also said he was wounded. Maybe he was wounded from his attempts to get away from the robbers. There are many out there today that have been morally wounded and disabled by the battles of this life. Hurts, wounds, disappointments, rejections, torments, you name it. They're everywhere. Some lost everything they ever owned. All their hopes and prospects seem not to exist. They need a touch from the Lord. They need the ministry of the Holy Ghost. The only way we can give them the ministry to the whole of the Holy Ghost is be submitted to the Holy Spirit and Jesus and the Father in our lives. Submit our lives so the Lord so we can be a conduit so we can be like uh, uh, God can work through us. That's when the ministry is effective. When God can work through us. To the ones that don't belong to the Lord. We've already been touched by Jesus. Some of us, most of us, some listen to this. But there are many out there that have not been touched by Jesus. Are we just going to let them? We're going to pass by them. We're going to pass by and not pray about those that are our enemies, our neighbors that are our enemies. Are we not going to just we just going to keep that grudge, keep that vengeance in our heart against them? Or are we going to let God soften us to be able to pray for him? It's in his word. He says, pray for those that use you and persecute you and do all kind of things to you. That's what it says back at verse 31. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Verse 32 and likewise a Levite. When he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. The Levite and the priest. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him he had compassion on him verse 34 and went to him and bound up his wounds pouring in oil and wine and set him on his beast and brought him to an end and took care of him verse 35 and on the morrow he departed he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more 
when I come again, I will repay thee. Jesus took us where we were. He took us when we were laying on the side of the road, not literally, but spiritually. When we were laying there and everybody else was passing by and pull us out of the miry clay and pull us out of whatever we were in. And some of us, he touched our heart and soul deeply. We just got to remember where Jesus brought us from. That's all. We just got to remember the touch of Jesus Christ in our lives and be willing to reach out and touch somebody else's life with the same touch that we received, whether it's our enemy or not. The Samaritans and the Jew definitely didn't have a good relationship. You can best believe that. Verse 36, which now of these three Thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves. Verse 37. And he, the lawyer, said, he that showeth mercy on him, go and do likewise. So Jesus got him. He was trying to trip up Jesus, but Jesus turned it right back to him. He said, now you go and do likewise. Since you saw what, what happened, go and do likewise. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to go and do likewise. What is true holiness? In the parable of the Good Samaritan, the Lord sets forth two kinds of holiness. One is outward. And the other is deeply rooted in the heart. One is head knowledge. And the th right things to say. The other is saturated with grace and love. One is a false holiness. It wants to pass by on the other side of duty and service. The Levite and the priest who were holy mem holy ministers of the Jewish temple. Fell into this category. They were to be holy vessels unto God in Exodus 28 verses 1 through 3. They were to stand between God and the people in the Old Testament. The New Testament saints like Levites and priests are called of God and expected to exhibit Christ-like love and compassion. Second Corinthians four, six for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Either we have it or we don't have it. Either we have it or we're trying to get it. Either we're searching and seeking God for it. Or we're happy to be where we at in the spirit realm. Ephesians 5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Colossians 1, 12 and 13. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of of the inheritance of the saints in light who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So that means what we were is not what we are now is God wanting to work in our lives as we submit ourselves to him. We are the clay and he is the potter but we are his hands and feet living in the holiness of God he did it for us so that he could use us in the lives of others and not just for the sake of doing humane services 
which is still honorable and good. There's nothing wrong with doing good. But this sermon is not about doing good works for people. It's about having the love of God, the true love of God in your heart to be able to love your enemies above your own soul. Above your own ways that you used to doing. It's a process that God has to work in you. An effective work of the Lord is done in God's love. First Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 13.1. I'm going to go through that real quick. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. That word charity is love. I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So it look, look at that. It says we can speak with the tongues of men and of angels. But if we don't have love, we become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffer long in its kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all all things. Verse 8. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies. They shall fail. Whether there be tongues. They shall cease. Whether there be knowledge. It shall vanish away. For we know in part. And prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come. that Then that which is in part. Shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. When I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth. Faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest, Paul said, the greatest is charity. There is a need for steadfast holiness and service to the Lord without hypocrisy. Service without hypocrisy. The Levite and the priest they were doing they were stood before between man and God. But it, when it came time for them to do the work of the Lord and show the love of God in their hearts, they couldn't do it. We talked last week about wearing a mask. Only allowing people to see what you want them to see. And we said some reasons why people wear a mask is because we don't want people to discover the real us because they may not love us. We may fear rejection or think we are not worthy of being loved, maybe because of some childhood experience. Those listening to this, all of us listening, we all have had some of these things that are mentioned. So when we're together in an assembly, we have to remember 
the person next to me probably had much as much or more happen to them as if what happened to me. And we can have compassion for one another and pray for one another and grow in the Lord together to be able to love our enemies, love those that despitefully use you and persecute you and say all manner of evil. You may wear a mask because we're afraid that people will think we are not real Christians. So we put on a front to hide our insides. We may be fearful that they will find out about our struggles. We all have those struggles. We all have battles. But the value of a church is when we start to trust the Lord, then we can trust others. When we when we have that intimate relationship with the Lord, because we can't fool the Lord or impress the Lord. He already knows what we're capable of. And the more open we are. The more we can grow in the Lord together. They may think we are a weak Christian or think we are a hypocrite. But what is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is a person who does not preach what they practice. Nor practice what they preach. A hypocrite wears a mask and plays a role pretending to be someone they are not. The Greek word for a hypocrite is hypocrisis. Hypo crisis and that denotes someone who is acting out a part of a character in a play in a play they held mask over their face painted to represent the character they were playing to mask their real selves and play a part for the audience we seek not to conceal who we are, who we are. That's why it's so important to pray for one another. Mention one another in prayer when you're praying and just pray the word of God over them. Pray encouragement, pray joy, pray happiness. And if you do any kind of warfare for them, be sensitive to the Lord. Buying hurt, rejection, fear, torment, disappointments, anything, rejection, anything that the Lord, while he is training you to be an intercessor, a prayer warrior, shows you. That is needed in the body of Christ rather than the opposite of that. Jesus disapproved of the hypocrite for being religious and pious in public. In Matthew 6, 2. Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. Also verse 5 and verse 16. So Jesus is basically tell them, telling them there, therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. That is their reward being noticed by men. Verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. 
Verse 16, moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. In other words, we want to possess what we profess or confess. The hypocrite was more interested in an outward show of holiness rather than having real holiness in their heart. Those the Levite and the priest couldn't even do an outward show of holiness because they did not have the love of God in their hearts. They didn't love the Lord that God with all their heart, soul, mind and strength and their neighbor as themselves. Jesus spoke strongly of hypocrisy in Matthew chapter 23. You can read that when you get home. And all of Matthew 23 and, and all of really Matthew 24 are written in red. If you have a King James version, which is means that Jesus was talking there. Sincerity without hypocrisy should be the character of a Christian. That's what we're striving for. We're striving for sincerity without hypocrisy. Romans 12, 9, let love be without dissimulation. That word dissimulation means disguise or camouflage. Abhor that which is evil cleave to that to that which is good second corinthians 6 6 by pureness by knowledge by long suffering by kindness by the holy ghost by love unfeigned that word unfeigned means sincere or genuine First Peter one twenty two, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. There's a process that God is trying to work in us a process of the word of God, allowing the word of God to do its work because the Bible says the word of God is a sword. It can even divide the, the oneness of a human person. The Bible shows us it's body, soul, and spirit, one person, but three parts. But the Bible says that the sword of the spirit splits, divides the soul and the spirit. It divides it. And it says it even goes into the marrow of the bone. That's the power of the word of God. That is the power of the word of God. We don't know what we're doing with the seed that we're planting. So that's why as farmers, we are supposed to take care of that seed that we plant we're supposed to pray over that seed. When we plant a seed, we begin to pray over it in our prayer lives and bind the powers of darkness that try to take that seed out of their hearts in accordance with the parable of the sower. Faith should be also sincere. First Timothy 1 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. And of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. Second Timothy 1 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. I spoke long while back about sincerity as a Christian is our protection in the spirit realms. 
That's why when we go in the spirit realms, we have to be very careful of how we go into the spirit realms. Because if we go in there in a spirit of anger or a spirit of anything else other than the spirit of God or whatever, especially negative emotions, if we go into the spirit realm with negative emotions, it's best for us to stay out of the spirit realm. It's best to go to God and ask God to forgive you of being, forgive me of being angry, forgive me of being whatever the, the, the thing is. Don't use the things of God for our own purposes. Use them in accordance with the spirit of God. Yeah, we all have probably gotten mad and start praying in our anger against somebody. Well, not against them or for somebody, however we're praying. But that is not the correct way of praying. Because we may be setting ourselves up for retaliation in the spirit realms. It's best to handle the things of God in a godly manner rather than for our own selfish means, for our own selfish gains. It's a dangerous thing to do that. Living a holy life before the Lord to the best of our abilities from salvation to sanctification and holiness, holiness without hypocrisy. In Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. Luke 1, 75 in holiness and righteousness before him. Look what it says. All the days of our lives. God expects us to be holy unto him all the days of our lives. It's a work of the potter. It's a work of the potter. And we are the clay. Romans 6.22. But now being made free from sin. And become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. You see what it said? It said fruit. It is a fruit that God works in our lives. Holy fruit. Ephesians 4.23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So our relationship with the Lord is like a husband and wife's relationship. And those that are listening to this, men that are listening to this, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. Tell her, Every day you love her, kiss her on her forehead. Praise the Lord. Acts 24, 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. That's a work of the Lord. You see, the Lord has his work. We have our work cut out with the Lord. He wants to transform us as we allow him through his word. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us the courage to, of allowing you to work in our hearts and lives, Father. Oh, Lord, whatever it is we need. We ask you to work in our hearts and circumcise our hearts, O oh Lord. We pray, Lord, for the power in the name of Jesus 
to break any kind of sin in our lives, O oh Father, in the name of Jesus, and to allow you to have complete control in our lives, Lord, that we can completely surrender to you, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you, Lord. We know that the world doesn't revolve around us as individuals, but we're just part of your complete and entire plan, God. We pray for your strength, O oh Lord, to be able to stand while you're working in us. And Lord, not necessarily blame it on the evil one, the devil, but it just may be you trying to work in us to circumcise, to get rid of the things in our lives that should not be there. And Jesus Christ is our deliverer. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that if we need any kind of deliverance in any area, God, we submit ourselves to you, Holy Father. And Father, we pray that we do what we need to do using the word and the things of the spirit, O oh Lord, to accomplish being able to get rid of those things that may be keeping us from coming into complete maturity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we pray that you would use us in each and every person attached to answers to life. Lord, in every person listening to this, use as us as your hands and feet to touch those that need touch from the Lord. Oh, Father, even if it's our enemies, the ones that say they hate us, the ones that say they despise us, the ones that um, want to do complete harm to us, Lord, we pray your complete forgiveness over them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We pray, pray your complete love over them, Father, that their eyes and ears and mind be open to the things of the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God. We pray, O oh Father, that they don't go over into eternity without knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord, Father, in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, that we will have the, uh, the anointing of love in our ministries, Lord, in the name of Jesus and in this ministry, Father, in the name of Jesus. We worship you and we adore you, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. We pray for those that aren't here this morning, oh God, that you will touch their hearts and life, Father, in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, let them feel your touch. Let them feel your joy. Touch them in every part of their heart and life that they need to feel your touch, Lord, to make it through this life, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We worship you. We adore you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.